Today's scripture readings come uh, from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8 and 11 through 13. God is love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. The next scripture is John 15, verses 1 through 8. Jesus, the true vine. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This ends the reading. On a bright February morning, Sunday morning, shivering in her t-shirt and running shorts, Eileen Pagels, a history, historian of, of the late Roman Empire, early Christianity, writes this. I stepped into the vaulted stone vestibule of the Church of Heavenly Rest in New York City to warm up. I had not been inside a church for a long time. I was startled by my response to the worship. As I stood there, warming up from the cold February air, a thought came to me. Here is an extended family that knows how to face death. Knowing how to face death was on Pagel's mind that morning. Her son, Mark, had just been diagnosed with a fatal condition called pulmonary hypertension, from which he'd soon die. He was six and a half years old. And her husband, physicist Heinz Pagels, would die just a year later in a tragic rock climbing accident. Standing at the back of that church, Pagels writes in her book, Beyond Belief, I recognized uncomfortably that I needed to be there. Here was a place to weep. And here was a community that had gathered to sing and celebrate and acknowledge common needs and to deal with what we cannot imagine or control in our lives. The worship spoke of hope, the kind of hope that makes the unbearable bearable. As a historian, Pagels describes in many of her books what attracted people in the ancient empire of Rome in those first generations of the earliest church was that quality 
of being an extended family that knew how to abide in love and share love, and in doing that, face life's unbearable moments with patience and courage. It's what distinguished Christians from other religions. If you wanted to be a part of Christianity's competitors, if you wanted to enter the healing temple of Asclepius, you had to pay a lot of money to sleep there and have the snakes crawl over you. And if you wanted Isis's protection and healing, the goddess that comes out of Egypt, you had to pay for expensive initiation rites, multiple rites, and each one of them got more expensive. And then you had to pay for special clothing and special equipment. On the other hand, anyone in need was welcome in Christian communities. During the reign of Marcus Aurelius, remember him, the philosopher, emperor? We still read his meditations. You can find it at Barnes and Noble. A plague broke out in the empire, and a third of the population died. People didn't have Paxlovid or COVID shots. They just died and they didn't really understand how it spread or how it happened that you got sick, but they understood contagion. And so people withdrew into isolation and refused to help anyone who was sick. Let them die alone. They were lied in the street and buried. Christian congregations, on the other hand, shocked their pagan neighbors by caring for the sick and the dying. They were the only ones that would care. They were the only ones that would pick the bodies up off the street and bury them. In fact, it, some historians of religion say that is the turning point that made Christianity, not just a little sect that might have disappeared somewhere, but turned it into a major force. So why did they do this? They did it because they were the kind of community that knew together how they could face death. Pagels, in her book, goes on to become a part of the Church of Heavenly Rest in New York City. And they stood with her as she walked through the death of her son and then her husband. And she said of that congregation, those who participate there weave the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection into their own lives. They become that story. A story that simultaneously acknowledges the reality of grief and fear and death, well, paradoxically, nurturing hope. Where does that capacity come from? It comes from texts like those words that Olin read a moment ago. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves is from God. Everyone who loves is born of the Spirit and knows God, for God is love. And those who abide in love, those who have compassion, which means inevitably, if you love, you get hurt. If you abide in love, you abide in God. That word that is used in those two passages, abide, is actually for John's gospel a kind of technical term. It's not just crucial in the letter, but in his gospel. It's in the, reading, the other reading that Olin read. Abide in me as I abide in you. I am the vine, you are the branches. Just as the branch abides, abides in the vine, I am the vine and those who abide in me abide in love. John, if you notice, uses 
that word abide 10 times in the first 10 verses of John 15. He actually uses it in his gospel 33 times. The majority of the uses of abide, that Greek word, meno, are in John. And it literally means, can mean to dwell or to stay or remain, but it also means to be held fast, to be kept continually. No matter what happens, no matter what grief, no matter what pain, even the pain of death, we are held fast. We are kept in a love stronger than our love sometimes can be. We dwell in a love greater than ours. And we know that when love is shared with us in those moments, by those around us, by that extended family. It's been a sad and heartbreaking week as the whole family sat in ICU at Bay State. None of us wants to sit in ICU with someone we love. And the loss of a child in particular brings us faith to face with the tragedy of death, the irrationality of it, the senselessness of it. There is no way anyone in their right mind can say, oh, these sort of things are God's will. That is crazy talk. The universe, to a certain extent, is indifferent. That's Kierkegaard's descendants in existentialism say it over and over. The irrational happens. But Elaine Pagels goes on to talk about that capacity of that church she found her way into by accident in New York City was a place where our capacious hearts can hold together sorrows that are unbearable alone a community and extended family in which we learn to grieve together. And that's who we have to be for Bob, for Betty and Tracy, for the whole family. That's who we can be and have been before for one another to turn the unbearable into something we can bear. In the third century, there's a third century rabbinic text in the Talmud that describes how Jews returning to the Temple Mount, which was by then a ruins having been destroyed totally after the third Jewish war by the Roman army. They would return to this ruined Temple Mount on pilgrimage. And at the close of that pilgrimage, there was a particular ritual. Those who entered that area who were joyous and happy turned to the right and went around the Temple Mount counterclockwise. But if you were suffering or grieving or lonely or sick, then when you entered, you turned to your right and went the other way around. So that the two would be moving in opposite directions. And that's how it feels, doesn't it, when something awful has happened? We're kind of pushing against the current. But then, this ritual is that when one of those people go who is, didn't have any problems and was happy to be doing this as a pilgrimage, went around counterclockwise, they would meet the people coming the opposite direction. And they had to stop and ask, what happened to you? They had to see those who were in pain 
and acknowledge their pain and ask them to tell their story. And once the story was told, the one who had asked looked into the eye of the ill or the bereft or the bereaving and says, may God comfort you. May you be wrapped in the embrace of this community. I see you. You are not alone. There's a profound wisdom in that. It's the wisdom of John's gospel. When we come here on Sundays, we don't need to pretend that we're okay when we're not. Here, on whatever ragged edge of life we find ourselves, we need to acknowledge we're simply swaddled in the safety and compassion of a community grounded in God's love. And we abide in that community. We are held fast in it because it abides in God's love and care. Rabbi Sharon Bruce, who's a reformed rabbi in California, has a book called The Amen Effect. And she says, the ancient rabbis didn't know anything about endorphins and oxytocin and dopamine. But they knew that our tender presence to one another is a direct line to the heart. They understood that showing up for one another is critical to our ability to cope with whatever life throws at us. It's why in Jewish life to this day, those who grieve stand in the midst of the congregation and pray the Kaddish, the mourner's prayer. The one who suffers repeatedly shares in that prayer in the midst of the community. I am broken, but I am not alone. Amen, amen, amen. In the midst of grief, we're not allowed to grieve alone because no one should walk through the valley of the shadow of death alone. The obligation of the expended community of faith is to be present, to witness, to listen, to offer strength. To let those who grieve abide in their sorrow held fast in our collective strength. So that's who we need to be for Tracy and Gail and John, Riley, Betty, others. To be a community that supports them without giving trite answers about why awful things happen or offering advice about what we did that worked for us. It's simply to be good listeners, to listen them back to hope. It's simply to walk with them, to love them in their pain, and to offer them a safe place where they don't have to pretend they're okay. Because, you know, look around you, none of us are totally okay. We all bear burdens. And to say by our presence to one another, your loved one has died and you're still alive. And we will hold your grief with you. And together we will love you back into life. Beloved, Let us love one another because love is from God and everyone who loves is from God. For God is love and those who abide in love abide in God. Amen.